Sr. Uskes, Chairman of the Malaysian branch of CIOB, <laughs> Professor Doug Jones, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Sundra, Dr. Sundra for providing the inspiration and then the facilities here for the Centennial Lecture. It was very much his concept right from the beginning and I would also like to thank the Malaysian branch which has been inspirational uh, over the past couple of years. Has been inspirational over the last couple of years uh, and I would like to thank the chairman, uh, Ms. Catherine Chow, for her support and for facilitating this event today. CIR, under its Royal Charter, is mandated to prom promote and facilitate the determination of private disputes through ADR globally, and that's important, globally. And it's fitting, therefore, that today in Malaysia we are celebrating our centenary at KLRCA with the Deputy President this year of our organization and President next year and the keynote speaker comes not from the UK as well but from Australia. We were founded 100 years ago by a group of professional Englishmen who worked in the construction industry and they wanted to avoid litigation through the courts. From that start CIR has grown so that it now has 13,000 members in 37 branches in 127 countries. Not bad. To learn something of the ethos of CIR, I think that it is worth looking at the career of our first president, elected in 1915, Lord Headley. He had many of the qualities and backgrounds of an Englishman of that age. He went to an English public school, in other words a fee-paying private school. He went to Cambridge. He was then called to the bar of the Middle Temple and then he became a civil engineer. So you can see he had a wide-ranging education which he put to good use building roads then in India. That breadth of education and experience extended into other areas boxing. And indeed he wrote a book on boxing in 1889 which was republished as recently as 2006. That was some achievement. Perhaps so far there's nothing unusual in his background. In 1913 however he had converted to Islam and he undertook the Hajj twice during his lifetime. And just in passing here, can I just say how delighted we are that in collaboration with INSEAF, we will be launching the first diploma in international Islamic banking arbitration in September of this year. And I invite you all, please do come along and learn with us. Returning to Lord Headley, he married an Australian author in 1921. Now, I don't know if it was cause and effect, but in 1922, he was declared bankrupt. <laughs> His life got somewhat strange thereafter as well, because in 1925, he was offered the throne of Albania. It came with a grant of half a million dollars and an annual stipend of $50,000. He turned it down, and his wife left him and returned to Australia. So on the one hand, you have what is perhaps the archetypal Englishman of his age. He had qualities of service, professionalism, and creativity, perhaps even a bit of an entrepreneur. He had a truly global vision, and he embraced the multicultural and diverse aspects of society which we see today through our own ethos, and indeed very much echoing that of this great country, Malaysia. I feel, therefore, that we are very much akin in taking that lesson with us to the core 
of our beliefs. I was appointed Director General in 2012. The centenary was on the horizon, and it wasn't long before I met the human dynamo that is Professor Doug Jones. He has been tasked with organizing and centering up the, this centennial year. In true CIR fashion, Doug is not from the United Kingdom, but looking globally, comes from Australia. His CV, as I hope with our outlook, is wide-ranging, and it, reflects, it was reflected in his appointment as an officer of the Australian Order, which he received in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2012. An international arbitrator with a passion for education, Doug is also a professor at the University of Melbourne and a visiting professor at Queen Mary College, London University. He is also an author, and I wait eagerly the seminal work on boxing or cricket. Not yet written, I understand, but he has indeed authored Building and Construction Claims and Disputes. He has authored Commercial Arbitration in Australia, and he is today delivering our centennial lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Doug Jones. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and so many of my friends, um, it's a great honour to be asked to give this lecture. The centenary of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators is a historic milestone for both the CIARB and for the international commercial dispute resolution community. We gather here today in what was an outpost of empire at the time of the formation of the Institute. It is now a thriving independent country and a leading centre for international dispute resolution in a region dominating the trade flows of the world. That it is thought appropriate to celebrate the centenary of the Institute here in the presence of its local president-elect is a testament to the truly global reach of the Chartered Institute and I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. An important question is this, how do we identify the SIAB and what does it stand for today? I will quote from a former chair of the Institute, Alan Davson, of whom I will speak a little later, who gave a succinct statement of what was then regarded as the fundamental purpose of the Institute in 1931. It rings true today, but I will add a little to it later. He said, the object of the Institute of Arbitrators is to provide a means of justice which is prompt, inexpensive, and also efficient by offering to the business community the services of a body of men we would add women today, skilled in various technical branches of industry and commerce, who are also acquainted with the legal incidence of arbitration and by insisting upon the prompt determination of disputes under the simplest rules of procedure involving small expense. Unquote. It's from this core objective that the Institute's role as an educator, an accreditor, and as an international professional network has developed over the past century, culminating in the worldwide organisation of which we are so proud today. I would like firstly to take you on a journey through the history of the Institute beginning with its inception in 1915 and navigating its history through the expansion of its branches, its activities, its objectives its migration to the Asia-Pacific region in particular, and its role in stimulating legislative, institutional and political developments. Condensing a century of history of such a dynamic global organisation, 
to a short presentation is no easy task and I wouldn't wish you to think that my account this evening is in any way complete. Let me say, however, that a history of the Institute was published just over a month ago. In competition, it would seem, with the history with which you've just been provided. Which, apart from providing a comprehensive narrative of the history of the Institute, proves to be a refreshing read. It's available for purchase. It isn't free, but I would encourage all of you to buy one. I will then move to a discussion of the current state of international arbitration and some recent trends and developments which are advancing the field of international dispute resolution so that within that context I can conclude by saying a few things about the future of the CIRB in the coming century. Firstly, some history. A journey begins on the 1st of March 2015 when a small group of professionals led by H.C. Emery, a London solicitor, established the Institute as an unincorporated association with a view, quote, to raising... Uh, to raising the status of arbitration to the dignity of a distinct and recognised position as one of the learned professions. The Institute in its infant state bore little resemblance to the global network that it is today, although its core underlying objective to promote arbitration as a profession was established from day one. As a small organisation in the early years, the Institute's activities were directed towards encouraging the practice of settling disputes by resolution rather than by litigation, promoting the study of the law and practice relating to arbitration and supporting its reform. Membership was selective and candidates were tested through examination before being admitted amongst the Institute's ranks. Members professional focus was primarily then on domestic construction disputes and membership was a combination of lawyers, architects and engineers. There are two aspects of the Institute to examine during this period, namely the Institute's activities in the arena of arbitral professional practice and its initiatives in providing education and training for practitioners and the business community at large. The Institute began appointing arbitrators from within its own ranks during the 1920s and regulations for the appointment of arbitrators were issued in 1925 based on the rules adopted by the then London Court of Arbitration and the Society of Architects. An arbitration committee was established and it compiled lists of appropriately qualified members who were willing to act as arbitrators. In this way, the Institute, from a very early stage in its life, began to assemble a pool of qualified and experienced arbitrators to offer to the commercial community. This pool has grown in size and expertise over today. Until today, it proudly consists of a select group, including uh, chartered arbitrators from an array of jurisdictions and areas of specialty around the world. At the same time, the Institute committed itself to a range of educational initiatives. On the one hand, the CIR began training arbitral practitioners, and on the other, it made efforts to educate the business and legal communities about the advantages of arbitration. For example, its capacity to achieve the more expedited resolution of disputes than poss were possible in the courts of the time. These objectives were pursued from the CIRB's inception with the publication of its journal Arbitration, which disseminated information on arbitration issues and challenges and continues to do so today. The journal was and remains a channel through which the Institute communicates its ideas, encourages dialogue on the issues facing the arbitral process, and discusses avenues for reform to overcome these obstacles. 
The Institute's efforts at facilitating dialogue amongst its members included organising meetings to discuss learned papers and developing a small library. Mock arbitrations were first held in 1926 to give members the opportunity to practice their skills in managing arbitration cases. These were popular for many years and were soon supplemented by an annual arbitration team competition. Such activities fostered a collaborative climate and an enthusiasm amongst the Institute's members for developing their skills and knowledge as a professional association. Indeed, early initiatives such as these paved the way for many of the opportunities for practice and training that we enjoy today, including events such as the annual Willem C. Viss Commercial Arbitration Moot in Vienna and an annual Chartered Institute International Arbitration Moot held in Sydney. The Institute's educational work progressed steadily during the 1920s and throughout the 1930s. This progress can largely be attributed to a member by the name of Alan Davison, from whom I quoted earlier. In 1927, he pointed out how the American Arbitration Association, formed only the year before, was already collaborating with US law schools and universities and carrying out special studies in conjunction with other bodies. Noting how research had become the driving force behind the American Arbitration Association, Davison believed the time had come for the Institute to forge ahead with direct services and educational programs. He played a key role in setting up the Institute's first lecture series that year and established an education committee and arranged regular lunches with guest speakers covering topics in arbitration. Momentum slowed in subsequent decades due to the turbulent global economy into which it was born, the First World War, the Great Depression, and later the Second World War. Despite these challenges, the Institute made a number of notable developments during this period in raising its profile as an organisation and the profile of arbitration as a dispute resolution process. It was incorporated as a company, limited by guarantee, in 1925, and it established its first international branch in Sydney, of all places, in 1927, marking the first step in the creation of a global network of branches. The period between the world wars may be characterised to a large extent by the redirection of the Institute's focus towards the international arena under the presidency of Lord Asquith. During his presidency between 1933 and 1942, Lord Asquith became one of the CIRB's renowned pioneers by contributing to a number of landmark developments. Under his leadership, the Institute played a major role in securing the passage of the long-awaited 1934 Arbitration Act to succeed the previous enactments dating back to 1889. And it collaborated actively with other bodies including the London Court of Arbitration and the American Arbitration Association. Towards the end of the 1930s, judicial support for arbitration was increasing as courts began to stay proceedings in favour of arbitration and refrain from regularly setting aside awards. Indeed, the Institute was making advance, advances on a number of fronts during this important period of its history. The tragedy that beset the world with the onset of the Second World War had a devastating impact on the global economy. In its aftermath, the Institute's steady progress ground to a halt. Amidst a stagnant atmosphere in international trade and in the absence of any concerted effort to pursue the CIRB's international visit, the Institute floundered. Activities in the area of professional education and the articulation of new ideas also ebbed. Thankfully, in the 1960s, the tide turned 
and with renewed determination on the part of the Institute's members and the leadership of the Institute, it was re-energised and refocused on promoting the benefits of arbitration on a global scale. The journal, which was the circulatory system for the themes and ideas of the Institute, took up this cause in earnest and encouraged members to look beyond the confines of the United Kingdom towards the promotion of arbitration and the Institute around the world. Bill James took the reins in 1970 with an unrivalled ambition and fervour for the Institute's educational activities. During his presidency, the focus of the Institute's training was expanded to encompass the study of an array of important arbitration issues such as the role of the expert witness and the Institute's examinations were then reintroduced. He foresaw that an increase in the membership and scope of the Institute's activities would enhance the CIRB's influence and potential. He pursued links with consumer bodies interested in devising their own consumer arbitration schemes and promoted arbitration on the widest scale, beyond the confines of the construction realm in which most English domestic arbitrators had comfortably settled. The significance of Bill's efforts in this respect cannot be overstated. The use of international arbitration in other areas of commercial law, ranging from intellectual property to shareholder disputes, demonstrated the flexibility and reliability of arbitration as a dispute resolution process for the needs of the global business community. The 1970s were characterised by the rapid transformation of the Institute from an association into a dedicated professional organisation. This was achieved by the appointment of a full-time secretary, the substantial expansion of the organisation's membership, and by developing close ties with the London Court of Arbitration. The CIR looked beyond the confines of the construction industry and devised initiatives in other areas of commerce. The Education Committee was reconstituted and evening lectures and discussions were revived. This decade of activity raised the Institute's public and professional profile, leading to the granting of a Royal Charter in 1979. The Royal Charter described the CIRB's vision of promoting arbitration and equipping practitioners to meet the demands of international commerce as follows. The promotion and dissemination as a learned society of a wider knowledge of private dispute resolution by means of meetings, conferences, seminars and lectures, and by the publication of relevant materials, including a journal and other literature. Further developments were made on the education and trading front under Chairman Gordon Hickmott. A new method of assessment was devised, which involved solving practical problems that occur in arbitration practice and by a greater emphasis on written questions. This mode of assessment laid the foundations for the currently used scenarios and questions in the international and domestic accelerated route to fellowship courses. The program that was offered globally was part of a scheme to ensure that candidates for fellowship of the Institute were assessed in any part of the world in the same format and on the same standards. As a result of the consistent standard of accreditation of fellows and arbitrators worldwide, the Institute is today acknowledged as providing gold standard training and accreditation. This is a unique achievement of the Institute which continues to impress us today and sets the Institute apart from other arbitration and dispute resolution bodies around the world. It is also important to note the contribution of Cedric Barclay, a giant of international arbitration in London, president of the Institute in 1969, who raised geographic expansion to the top of the agenda. Barclay encouraged members to attend international conferences, including the third international arbitration conference in Venice and the fourth conference in Moscow. His efforts culminated in the establishment 
of an international committee in 1973, whose objective was to venture into previously uncharted territories. The geographical expansion of the Institute was supremely important, given the capacity of commercial arbitration to resolve international disputes and the need to have a global presence in order to take advantage of this capacity. Due credit must be given to Barclay for his role in inspiring such an expansion. The chapter of the CIRB's history from 1970 onwards is characterised by its rapid advancement towards the goal of achieving a global presence. The East Asia branch of the Institute was established in 1972 when the Institute had only 2,200 predominantly English members. At the forefront of the developments in the global economy were rapid advancement by Asian economies, particularly China, and increasing international interest in oil and gas exploration. During this time, the membership of the Hong Kong chapter flourished and for a time exceeded the membership in neighbouring Asian chapters. The dawning of the 80s saw Ray Turner appointed as chairman and in the same spirit as his predecessors, he set up a working party dedicated to the pursuit of geographical expansion of the CIRB's presence and activities. This fruitful initiative led to the founding of branches in Ireland, Kenya, New Zealand. Meanwhile, the East Asia branch, based in Hong Kong, continued to grow, cementing its position as a hub for arbitration in Asia. Amongst other benefits, Hong Kong enacted new arbitration legislation in 1982, seeking to align with their English roots and also embrace the Chinese tradition of conciliation widely employed by the local business community. The significant landmark of the late 20th century was, in my view, the ratification of the UNCITRAL model law on international commercial arbitration in 1985, and any discussion of the past century which omits this milestone would be incomplete. The model law sought to draw together the range of legal traditions around the world at a time when the existing frameworks and rules for arbitration were skewed heavily in favour of European legal procedure and jurisprudence. For arbitration to achieve a truly global reach and presence, it was essential to offer a process that accounted also for the legal traditions of countries, developing and otherwise, with civil law legal systems outside Europe, that lacked a tradition of international arbitration. A notable achievement of the Institute in the 90s was the renovation of its system of governance to promote efficiency in decision making and broader representation of the Institute's multicultural membership in the Council. These advancements were instigated first by Sir Michael Carr and later pursued by subsequent presidents including Ronald Bernstein and Kenneth Seven. Pursuant to this theme of global representation in governance, regional representatives were elected to the Council. Foreign branches were given increased autonomy, and two new offices of overseas vice presidents were created in 1994 and 1996 to give greater standing to its international members in governance. And at this time, the CIR established a 10-person executive board which was accountable to the Council. In addition, the Institute was registered in 1990 as a not-for-profit charity. This is a core element of the Institute's character and attests to the commitment of its members to the service of the business and legal communities. The Institute's members and leaders have long been driven by a sense of service rather than self-interest, and this has preserved the integrity of the CIR and will continue to do so in the years to come. Further developments in the CIRB's governance were fostered in 1999 as the position of President was transformed from an honorary position to an elected role. And in the performance of their ambassadorial role, the Presidents from this point onwards could expect 
to have a high level of involvement in all areas of the Institute's activities. Changes were again pursued in 2003 under the chairmanship of John Campbell following a review by the then Director General, Dare Farah Hockley. The objectives of the Institute were redrawn and its efforts refocused towards, first, the international promotion of the ideal that private dispute resolution was a more flexible, less expensive and less time-consuming option than litigation. Secondly, offering education and training to those seeking to qualify as practitioners and others with an interest in the subject. And thirdly, disseminating knowledge and information on private dispute resolution through the Institute's role as a learned society. The Institute remained dynamic as an organisation and continued to grow in the 21st century. On 28 February 2005, the Royal Charter was revised to implement a number of fundamental changes. Importantly, the Council was replaced by a fully elected Board of Trustees of 12 members, half of whom represented regions of the world outside the UK. The status of Chartered Arbitrator was introduced and the Office of Honorary President was replaced by the Honorary Office of Patron. The revision of the Royal Charter was one of the final steps in internationalising the CIA in its governance. The Institute has expanded tremendously throughout Asia, not to mention Africa, continental Europe and North America, with branches now rooted in East Asia and Southeast Asia and South Asia, including Malaysia, mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Indonesia, Japan, North Korea, the Philippines, Singapore, South Korea, Thailand and Vietnam. Let me now take a moment to highlight some of the milestones in Asian arbitration in recent decades as related to the Chartered Institute. First, I would like to take this opportunity to discuss the development of arbitration in Malaysia. In recent years, Kuala Lumpur has emerged as a leading venue for arbitration in the Asia-Pacific region. In furtherance of the CIRB's global mission, in 1989, Morris Pleasance travelled to Malaysia to encourage its members to form a Malaysian branch. Conferences were still a major part of the Institute's strategy and the Malaysian branch has contributed significantly to a number of very major conferences. The Malaysian government's recognition of the CIR as a key player in reforming the ADR landscape is reflected by the invitation by the Malaysia Attorney General's Office for the CIR to assist in the drafting of the 2005 Arbitration Act. And further developments include the Institute's continuous collaboration with the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Indeed, the CIR has positioned itself as a prominent player and driver of arbitration in Malaysia. The KLRCA was one of the earliest regional arbitration institutions in the Asia-Pacific region, established in 1978. You've got its history there. Although its development was more gradual than some of the Asian counter counterparts, active growth in recent years has seen the KLRCA rocket towards all-round success and distinguish itself from other arbitration institutions institutions, most notably through the launch of its I-Arbitration rules. The KLRCA received international recognition for these rules when it was awarded the Innovation uh, Prize as an individual organisation in 2012 by the GAR Awards in Bogota, Colombia. Other remarkable achievements include the KLRCA's amendment of the fast track rules as well as its commitment to maintaining a high standard of ethics having signed a corporate integrity pledge in 2013 and incorporated anti-corruption provisions into its code of conduct last year. These accomplishments are factors 
in the KLRCA's success and a testament to the KLRCA leadership by example in the field of international arbitration in recent years. The Hong Kong Centre was opened in 1985 and the Singapore Centre in 1991, latecomers to the field, relatively speaking. Both institutes are highly desirable arbitration venues for disputing parties and one of the key uh, markers of the SEAC's growing importance has been its increased caseload. Hong Kong has long been referred to as the bridge into Asia or the bridge into China and it is a desirable venue for disputing parties from both a common and civil law point of view. It uh, also has enjoyed a sharp increase in filings of arbitration and has advanced arbitration rules recently amended. The Indian branch of the CIR is also progressing notwithstanding some of the differences in approach taken by the courts in arbitration matters. India has strengthened its pro-arbitration culture through reforms to the arbitration regime which limit the grounds for judicial intervention. India's enforcement regime of arbitral awards has long been problematic despite being a signatory to the New York Convention as the Indian Arbitration Act recognises only awards made in a convention country that has also been added to the Indian Official Gazette uh, to which the convention applies. And although the Gazette currently contains about one third of the New York Convention signatories, it was promising to see China and Hong Kong gazetted in March 2012. Arbitration in China has boomed over the last few decades and there are now over 160 arbitration commissions throughout China. Since the enactment of the arbitration law in 1994, key amendments have been introduced to strengthen the Chinese arbitration regime in at least two respects. Firstly, the statutory grounds upon which Chinese courts can refuse enforcement of domestic awards have been narrowed, and parties to an arbitration may apply to Chinese courts for interim relief prior to the commencement of arbitration. Admittedly, there has been some volatility in recent years, particularly in the changes to the structure of CTAC. But other organisations, such as the Beijing Arbitration Commission, uh, continue to flourish. The South Korean chapter of the CIR was opened in May 2012 and has enjoyed a large degree of support and activity. There is a high level of interest among students, lawyers and Korean companies which has helped progress the development of the local branch, which is also supported by the Korean government. And following the opening of the Seoul International Dispute Resolution Centre in May 2013, Seoul offers the business community another alternative to existing arbitration venues. Its recent entry into a number of free trade agreements with the US and Europe has begun stimulating the growth of arbitration in Korea. As these important economic arrangements promote international trade with Korean companies, there is little doubt that the Seoul International Dispute Resolution Centre will play a vital role in administering international arbitrations in the future. Australia's entry into the international arbitration scene was more recent. Following the CIRB's Australian branch initiatives to garner government and judicial support, the UNCTRAL model law was adopted for both domestic and international arbitration, it having been adopted for international arbitration some time ago. And since then there has developed a sturdy pro-arbitration culture. There is a cooperation agreement between the Australian Centre for International Commercial Arbitration, the Australian International Commercial Dispute Centre and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators who operate uh, as a team. Um, and that has assisted the role of the uh, Akika as the appointing authority, uh, default appointing authority under the Australian International Arbitration Act. These characteristics make Australia 
also another highly desirable and reliable option for disputing parties in the Asia-Pacific region. So this history brings us to the present and to an age where arbitration enjoys supremacy as the dispute resolution process of choice for cross-border commercial disputes. Looking back at the history of the CIARB, we celebrate the diligence and innovation of the Institute's leaders and its members. These stories of the past serve to instruct us and perhaps to inspire us to move forward. In exploring the coming century for the CIR, we must ask what challenges lie ahead and what trends can be predicted in international commercial dispute resolution. Let me briefly mention three only of these trends. Firstly, arbitration and mediation. Mediation should be watched keenly in the coming decades. It continues to increase in popularity and its use as an independent process and also in conjunction with litigation and arbitration is growing around the world. The rise of mediation is due in no small part to the increasing demands placed on the limited resources of courts and tribunals. This rings true in common law jurisdictions where floods of court filings have led in many places to mandatory court-referred mediation. This process was approached by counsel with scepticism in the early years, but its effectiveness in resolving disputes and the high levels of party satisfaction associated with the outcome of successful mediations has led to a willingness among counsel to respect the integrity of the process and to consider mediated outcomes wherever possible. Court-referred mediation has been adopted in a number of jurisdictions, including in the United States of America and Canada, amongst other places. And the implementation of mediation in these countries has had a positive impact on their domestic jurisprudence and a departure from the historical adversarial mindsets in favour of collaborative processes of present and future developments. The increase in the number of voluntary mediations since mediation was introduced in Australia, for instance, serves to illustrate the point. One important characteristic of mediation is its capacity to resolve disputes while maintaining positive business relationships between the parties. The adverse impact of projected litigation and indeed of arbitration is no mystery. Where disputes arise between commercial partners, a collaborative as opposed to an adversarial approach to resolving them is more conducive to the maintenance of strong commercial relations. Mediation is also conducive to reaching innovative solutions and remedies, which encompass an infinitely broader array of options than those remedies available to parties in arbitration or litigation. I do not, however, wish to paint a wholly idealistic picture of mediation. Its non-adjudicative character and the reliance on good faith and trust between the parties can lead to justifiable limitations on and criticisms of the process. The differences between mediation and arbitration are fundamental. One has a consensual outcome, the other an imposed one. The skill sets deployed by third party neutrals in the two processes are distinct. Many neutrals practice as one or the other, but not both. The combination of the processes, at least by the same neutrals, is a controversial one, but which deserves exploration for the future. Mediation in conjunction with arbitration, known as MedArb or ArbMed, is widely used in China. These processes raise conflict of interest issues, which have long been debated in circles by international commentators. These innovative hybrid dispute resolution models 
are deserving of recognition and have proven to be successful in the environments in which they have been used. The view that an arbitrator who is present in mediation proceedings is best placed to determine arbitration proceedings between the parties is worthy of further exploration. Such processes are not unknown in common law jurisdictions. In the state of New South Wales, from where I come, a hybrid MEDARB process has been used successfully in a statutory scheme for workers' compensation for a number of years. Developments in mediation and conciliation have also taken place at the international level, with the UNCITROL model law on conciliation having been enacted in, promulgated in 2002. One of the major obstacles for international mediation remains the enforceability of a mediated settlement in contrast with the enforceability of arbitral awards under the New York Convention. The Convention's ratification worldwide has been critical to the success of international arbitration. Mediation success and advancement as a complement to international arbitration will in part depend upon initiatives to develop a solid international framework for the conduct of mediation in international disputes and for cross-border enforcement of settlements reached therein. The UNCITRAL Working Group on Arbitration and Conciliation met earlier this year and continues its endeavours to develop a convention on the international in and enforcement of commercial settlements. At its meeting in New York in February, the working group considered the legal and practical issues associated with developing such an instrument. The group considered that the New York Convention could provide a useful basis in doing this, although it was recognised that there are distinct issues raised by the enforcement of settlements which will need to be addressed. The group identified a number of issues including the lack of domestic legislation for enforcing settlement agreements in many nations worldwide. It can, I suggest, be predicted with confidence that mediation will play an increasingly important part in international commercial dispute resolution in the years to come. Its effective combination with arbitration and other forms of international dispute resolution such as dispute boards will be one of the significant challenges for the future. The second challenge I would like to discuss briefly is domestic commercial courts. Another trend which has made great headway in recent decades has been the birth of national courts specialising in commercial, construction, technology matters around the world of which the English Technology and Construction Court, the Singapore International Commercial Court and the DIFC courts are examples. Specialised courts are increasingly demonstrating their capacity to resolve complex disputes expeditiously so as to arrival the efficiency that arbitration has long claimed to offer. Judges in specialised courts have developed the technical expertise in specialty areas of the law that is necessary to deal with complex and technical factual disputes. They rival the once distinct industry expertise that was the province of arbitrators alone. Not only are specialised courts able to compete with the benefits that arbitration has long claimed to distinguish it, but they can carry the advantages of the sovereign powers that they wield and the freedom from many of the constraints for arbitral tribunals as creatures of contract. Among the foremost of these is the difficulties faced by arbitral tribunals in conducting multi-party arbitration. Difficulties of this sort arise frequently in string contracts which often feature arbitration clauses in some but not necessarily all of the contracts. The limited ability to consolidate proceedings and to join additional parties has long been a hurdle for arbitration, but not for courts with their compulsive power of joinder and consolidation. The challenges of string contracts are particularly prominent in the construction industry. And the English Technology and Construction Court is an example of a specialised court 
easily able to overcome these challenges in contrast with arbitral tribunals, which are confined to the ambit of the arbitration agreements under which they are constituted. The success of specialised courts and their increasing viability for resolving international disputes raises the question of whether the monopoly that arbitration holds over international enforceability by virtue of the New York Convention will enable it to remain the preferred international commercial dispute resolution process for the future. The enforcement of foreign judgments among common law countries is relatively straightforward and increasingly liberal amongst close trading partners. Elsewhere, regional arrangements are growing apace and the Hague Conference is considering a renewed effort to establish a multilateral judgments convention following the promulgation in 2005 of a convention for judgments issued in business disputes in which the parties had included exclusive jurisdiction agreements. Designed as a counterpart to the New York Convention for Court Judgments, the choice of court convention has yet to be ratified by enough nations to be implemented, but its implementation would be a major step towards securing an instrument for the international enforcement of selected court judgments. The parallel initiatives of the DIFC courts and the Singapore International Commercial Court to seek enforceability of their judgments aims at entering into reciprocal memoranda of understanding with courts of other jurisdictions, thus creating a network of jurisdictions in which their judgments will be enforced with relative ease. The New York Convention has given international commercial arbitration a monopoly on the resolution of cross-border disputes. But as the issues with the enforceability of judgments of these commercial courts fade, arbitration will need to find ways to remain competitive if it's to continue to flourish. The third issue I'd like to look at is investor state dispute settlement. Investor state dispute settlement is another feature of the international arbitration landscape, although very different from international commercial arbitration. And it has grown in prominence in recent decades, mainly due to the inclusion of arbitration clauses in modern bilateral and multilateral investment treaties. The rationale for investor state arbitration is the protection of investors from the regulatory opportunism of governments. For example, in circumstances where a foreign investor is persuaded to invest uh, with promises of a stable and favourable economic and legal framework, only to have that framework altered to its disadvantage. The primary administering institution of investor state arbitration uh, has of course been ICSID. However, the rapid growth in the use of ISDS and the public sensitivity of the issues it addresses have generated a range of controversies which are presently raging in a number of parts of the world. And there has been, uh, in my country and presently in Europe, a strident political backlash to ISDS. In my written paper, I look at this in a little detail, but I won't uh, detain you with that uh, tonight. Uh, those of you that you are interested can read that material later. Let me say, however, that uh, there are a wide range of proposed modifications to the current investor state arbitration model uh, and some solutions to the challenges being debated. And although the future is uncertain, it's clear that innovation will be critical to develop and implement effective solutions to these challenges. In the midst of the debate, not all of which could be regarded as informed. There is, in my view, a very real risk that the fundamental distinction between investor state arbitration and commercial arbitration will be lost to the disadvantage of commercial arbitration, and this would be most undesirable. So much for three prospective challenges. Let me now turn to the Chartered Institute and the future. Given these challenges, what role should the CIR play 
in shaping the way forward. As I said earlier, mediation is a process which has attracted a surge of interest in the last decade. The CIRB has endorsed mediation in its capacity as an alternative as an, and as a complement to arbitration. The Institute accredits mediators, provides courses and modules in mediation around the world. The Institute's horizons have expanded towards the promotion of mediation as a form of private dispute resolution that offers distinct advantages. The role of mediation along with arbitration will no doubt be furthered in the coming years and it is my belief that this will be championed by the Institute through its activities and by arbitrators themselves who are beginning to experiment increasingly within their mandate. In the same vein, the legal community will look to hybrid dispute resolution processes as, with their, as, with their, as will their clients and will wish to explore the benefit that options can offer to disputing parties. In the light of this, it's my view that the grand landscape of international dispute resolution is set to expand in the future years as new options and features continue to emerge and take their place within it. The CIRB will bear great responsibility for maintaining the high regard around the world for international commercial arbitration, which will be essential to the survival of international commercial arbitration, as well as reacting to and leading these changes to dispute resolution outside the traditional space of commercial arbitration. To do this, the Institute must continue to innovate in its educational offerings to the legal profession and to others. It must update and maintain the highest standard for the assessment of candidates for accreditation. Its activities in this arena must ensure that accredited arbitrators are highly competent, reliable and trusted by the commercial community. A well-rounded profession with a high level of knowledge and expertise is achieved not only by delivering courses and modules, but also by holding conferences and networking opportunities all year round. Continued advancement by the CIRB in this direction is essential for the long-term growth and perhaps even the survival of international commercial arbitration. The publishing of practice notes and guidelines has contributed and continues to contribute to the maintenance of standards in international arbitration. More of that in a moment. Looking ahead, the Institute must not be a static organisation confined to its present activities and objectives. It needs to continue to demonstrate the innovation upon which its past success was founded. Recent initiative by the ICC in establishing the Young Arbitrators Forum should be applauded as it recognises the need to promote arbitration amongst younger practitioners. I recently attended an inspiring dinner in Hong Kong for young practitioners and students hosted by HK45, a body under the HKICA. And there was a spirited discussion there about a range of arbitration issues. Initiatives such as these provide young practitioners with the opportunity to establish professional networks, equip themselves with the knowledge and skills necessary for practice, and to ventilate new concepts and ideas and subject these to critique and discussion. Initiatives directed at younger practitioners are an emerging trend around the world, and this trend presents an opportunity upon which the Chartered Institute must capitalise. The CIRB is an international ADR society and an accrediting body. Uniquely so. Concentrating on and strengthening this will enable the CIRB to play a key role in the century to come. But how will this be accomplished? I'd like to discuss some particular areas in this context. Firstly, membership. Over the years, the CIRB has sought to confer membership on those seeking to be arbitrators and mediators. Hence, Alan Davson's succinct statement which I quoted at the commencement of this address. It is suggested that this focus ignores the fact 
that the domestic and international ADR community is a large field, including many active contributors who do not immediately or ever aspire to be arbitrators or mediators. I have in mind counsel, young lawyers seeking to establish a career, students, commercial managers, experts, in-house counsel, to name a few. Many such people do not seek to become third-party neutrals, but will play important roles in the process of resolving disputes. For the Institute to encourage them to seek to be educated and accredited as third-party neutrals will not only raise unrealistic hopes, but will fail to foster them in the capacity to serve well in other roles. The issue is not just about finding more members for the CIRB, useful though that may be. It is about achieving two quite important objectives. First, to provide relevant training and accreditation to as many members of the ADR community as possible. Second, is including with the Institute's membership perspectives on arbitration broader than those of arbitrators and mediators thus enriching all of the CIRB's activities, including its standards, and adding significantly to its credible outreach. Beyond this, by taking the lead in expanding the scope of education beyond council and arbitrators, the CIRB will contribute to more effective international commercial dispute resolution. Education and accreditation. The CIRB has established a series of pathways to membership with which many of you will be familiar. It is suggested that the time has come to revise them with the objective of providing opportunities for meaningful membership of the CIRB to those members of the ADR community of whom I have just spoken. The design of such courses and the establishment of appropriate accreditation upon successful completion will be a significant challenge. But if grasped and pursued with determination, it has the potential to move the CIRB to a new level. Moving into this area raises immediately the heavy involvement of universities in ADR training. Postgraduate courses in international dispute resolution abound around the world. To a degree, the CIRB is both a competitor of and collaborator with these institutions. Some of the Institute's courses, such as its Diploma in International Commercial Arbitration, compete with the diplomas and degrees offered by universities. The key to the Institute's success will be its capacity to have its membership qualification recognised as desirable and credible. In this regard, it will be important to keep in mind a critical distinction between the CIRB membership qualification and a university qualification. The membership qualification entails an ongoing commitment to the Institute, including payment of membership dues and an ongoing responsibility to maintain the standards of the CIRB and to contribute to its work, not just to receive the entitlements of membership. The linking of the membership qualification to continued professional development will, in my view, be critical to distinguishing it from an institutional degree. The CIRB will need to find ways to promote and facilitate this. Thinking globally, acting locally. The Institute has come a long way from its roots in the UK construction industry. Its unique strength lies in its global outreach. Looking forward, it is apposite to ask whether its financial structure and its administrative base in London should be assumed to be appropriate in the decades ahead. There is little doubt that its chartered status provides an international recognition of considerable value. And all international organisations need a base, not just for administration, a home, if you will. Of concern, though, is the inevitable tension between head office and the branches, and the imperative for the CIRB to extend its relevance beyond its English-speaking base to other legal traditions and cultures. That the Institute's next two presidents will be from Asia 
and the Middle East, and that one will be the leader of a prominent arbitral institution, and the other, a woman, highly respected in arbitration, is an eloquent expression of the strides that the CIR has made to internationalise. It would be easy, however, to be lulled into complacency by this quite remarkable circumstance. Questions needing careful consideration include, should more of the Chartered Institute's administration be decentralised? How can the sometimes unhelpful impression, some may say reality, of Bloomsbury Square bureaucracy be overcome? How to maintain the consistency of international standards of accreditation? Can the enthusiasm of branches be harnessed and deployed to global advantage within the existing financial and management structure? Keeping those questions in mind is critical. I don't provide answers tonight. Learned Society. For a number of years when I first became a member, my main encouragement to remain one was the journal. It offered me nothing else. Then, it remains a strong statement of the CIRB's commitment to its mandate as a learned society. There is, however, much more that can be done to further this aspect of its activities. As part of its global leadership role in the field of international ADR, are the guidelines and protocols published by the CIRB. These guidelines set standards and create opportunities for innovation in the practice of ADR around the world. The establishment of standards that are widely accepted and adopted demonstrates real intellectual leadership. Whatever may be said about soft law, it can be an important for force for coherence in international practice. Much more can and should be done to modernise and extend the reach of the Institute's body of standards and in doing so engage with the international community. Pursuing research and leadership in the debate on key issues within the practising community and governments should be fostered. As a learned society whose focus is on alternative dispute resolution, the CIR could contribute much to important international debates, such as that on ISDS, particularly in maintaining the difference between that and commercial arbitration, through the dissemination of information and the support of lively discussion among the global business, legal and political communities. Through collaboration, for instance, with the European Parliament, the International Chamber of Commerce and domestic law reform bodies, the CIRB will contribute its learned views based on empirical studies and scholarly debate towards formulating solutions to the challenges of today. With over 13,000 members in over 120 countries, the CIRB is an optimal position to inspire and effect change on a global scale. A final comment. An international regulator. There has been recent debate about the regulation of standards and conduct in international commercial arbitration. This has occurred in the context of the publication of the IBA guidelines on party representation and the recent amendments to the LCIA rules and a number of speeches given by the uh, Institute's patron, uh, Chief Justice Menon. The CIRB has a credible, well-established system for the regulation of the conduct of its members and a disciplinary process that is rigorous and transparent. As a membership organisation, this makes it unique amongst ADR bodies around the world in assuring the standards of conduct of its members. Additionally, its global reach is unmatched. This demonstrated competency could qualify it to serve the larger ADR community in a role which, with the endorsement of other leading arbitral organisations, would effectively provide some international regulator, regulatory uh, structure. Other leading arbitral organisations 
do not have mandates consistent with doing this, and professional bodies around the world have limited geographical authority. Let me say this in conclusion. There can be no assured future resting upon past success. There is, however, a strong foundation upon which the Chartered Institute can build. The opportunities are plentiful, indeed challengingly so. In this address, I have sought to move from the past to the future and to sketch some streams of potential development for the Institute in the context of today's international ADR challenges. For all of us who find the organisation one in which we consider it worthwhile investing, I trust sharing these thoughts will be of value. Thank you very much, Professor. If you could just